the Treasurer's Speech, then an ABC News special. Later, it's the budget reaction and analysis. Log in to ABC iView to check out recommendations. Tonight, another flood-related death as the southern Queensland town of Dolby cops a drenching, while over the border, some Lismore residents told to evacuate. Uh, yeah, it wasn't real good trying to get to sleep when you can hear water running under the bed. Frydenberg's fourth budget goes big on cyber security as well as tax relief for low and middle income earners. A new round of face-to-face -face peace talks between Russia and Ukraine. And tributes from around the world to feature in Shane Warne's memorial. Good evening, Matt Wordsworth with ABC News. A second man has been confirmed dead in the flood emergency in southern Queensland. Police divers recovered the 47-year-old man's body after he was swept to his death southwest of Toowoomba. The town of Dolby has borne the brunt of the flooding rains, but the deluge fell short of major levels. Les Mullins and his family woke to find water lapping their Dolby property. Bit of a long night for us, sitting there watching water come up. The floodwaters stopped at the front stairs, but Mr Mullins isn't happy about his water views. I'm sick of water, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to see any more water for a while. It's a sentiment echoed across the flood-weary town. It's not good. Five full floods in five months. John Wadwell is hosing out after parts of his caravan park were inundated. About 20 caravans had to be moved to higher ground. When we found the water was coming up yesterday morning, we had to. We were all down the park down there early as of this morning, helping people pack up to get them out because they said it was going to get pretty high. Thankfully, though, Dolby's Mile Creek peaked at 3.6 metres, well below the 2011 height. But it's still enough for some residents to reconsider where they call home. Yeah, I'm, I'm over it. Yeah, I head, head out of town where it's high and dry. <laughs> Barry Russell's home was spared, but only just. We had a centimetre to spare. On the Gold Coast, residents are also counting the cost of yet another deluge. This sports venue is only just back in business after the recent big flood. While the centre was spared the worst this time, it was an anxious night for owner Rebecca Mayer. It's very emotional. It's, it's harder talking about it now than it was this morning. I think everything's kind of kicking in again. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's horrific. But she knows from first-hand experience, it could have been worse. It only came to about here, so it just didn't come through the building at the front. So, yeah, it's like a metre difference compared to the last time. Plenty of people worse off than us. Could be down Lismore or Ukraine. Still counting their blessings as they mop up again. Kieran McKechnie, ABC News. The trauma of the flood crisis is also still raw for many in New South Wales and tonight large parts of the state are again on alert. Some regions were told to brace for up to 200 millimetres of rain and parts of Lismore have been under evacuation orders for most of the day. For the second time in a month, business owners in Lismore are preparing for a major flood. Paul Sullivan hadn't even finished cleaning out his clothing alterations shop when a fresh evacuation order was issued. Here we go again round two and uh, so hopefully it doesn't come over the wall. Bob Burnell runs a barbecue outlet in Lismore. He spent a sleepless night watching the weather system develop. Today he decided it was once again time to move his stock to higher ground. You've just got to err on the side of caution here and um, all my good friends here have put their hand up and come in to help us pack. The heavy rain which lashed the region overnight and into this morning eased in the middle of the day. But with the scars of the previous disaster still plain to see, authorities were taking no chances, ordering people to evacuate the Lismore CBD by 4pm. 
But regardless, even if it does not rain, we're still expecting flood levels to reach uh, near or exceed the major flood level uh, near Lismore later today into this evening. That would mean some properties in the industrial and residential areas of North and South Lismore could be inundated. Access to the city from some outlying areas has already been cut off, but fears of a major impact in the CBD have eased. The river levels um, are not expected um, to exceed and overtop the levee. However, um, it is borderline, so it depends on where that rainfall falls. This is the place where many Lismore locals come to keep an eye on the flooding situation. That gauge you've just seen measures the height of the Wilsons River and how many metres it has to rise until it overtops this levee. Everyone is hoping the countdown doesn't get to zero. And there's so many people who are so distraught having lost everything and they're still going through all their dramas of what happened. And hearing that rain again would set them off. Hoping for the best but preparing for the worst. A way of life for those living in the flood zone. Bruce McKenzie, ABC News, Lismore. Fuel excise will be cut in half and millions of Australians will receive extra cash and tax breaks to help them with the growing cost of living. The government's using the budget handed down in Canberra tonight as a springboard for the election. Even though many economists believe now is the time to start winding back spending, the Coalition has again decided to splash cash to try to win over voters. Here's political reporter James Glenday. When the cost of everyday items rise, politicians get nervous. And in the past year, the price of food, fuel, as well as health care and, of course, housing have all gone up. So, congratulations. And there are fears more families could soon struggle to make ends meet. With an election just weeks away, the Treasurer knows his future and that of the Morrison government could hinge on tonight's budget. So, unsurprisingly, it contains a suite of sweeteners worth billions, aimed at easing the cost of living and clawing back votes. Hello. Is the Liberal Party now the party of big spending, big government? James, the Liberal Party is the party of lower taxes. As part of the cost of living package, the fuel excise will be halved for the next six months. From midnight, it'll be slashed from about 44 cents to 22 cents per litre, meaning owners of a mid-sized car could save about $12 a tank, though it will cost the budget around $3 billion. There's also a one-off $250 cost of living payment, which about 6 million people get automatically in April. It'll go to those on welfare, including pensioners, veterans and some concession card holders. About 10 million working Australians will also get a one-off tax bonus. $420 will be added to the low and middle income tax offset. Depending on what you earn, you could get up to $1,500 back, though the entire offset will end after this financial year. These measures are mostly being funded by an improvement to the nation's finances. Treasury expects the budget bottom line to be about $103 billion better than it did at Christmas because it underestimated how fast the economy would recover from the pandemic. The nation's deficits are still big, $78 billion next financial year. And by mid this decade, we're forecast to still be $43 billion in the red. But it's not as bad as first thought. That's again partly because the tax intake has been boosted by iron ore, gas as well as coal prices which are all higher than expected, while unemployment is lower and forecast to fall below 4% in a few months time, meaning the government expects to spend less on welfare and get more in income tax. Tonight, the government is again promising wages are going to go up. It assumes that even though the cost of living is increasing rapidly now, over the next four years, it believes pay packets will grow even faster. These stats are going to be a big part of the election because for much of the past decade, these sorts of forecast wage increases have not materialised. There are also warnings pre-election spending risks overheating the economy, driving up interest rates and inflation faster. Isn't it an irresponsible measure simply to buy votes ahead of the federal election? You've got Australian families who will think it's a good idea to pay less at the Bowser. With unemployment so low and businesses searching for workers, the budget also has billions to increase skills and training. New apprentices will be eligible for up to $5,000, while employers who take them on could receive up to $15,000 in wage subsidies. Small businesses will also be incentivised to train staff. They'll get a $120 tax deduction for every $100 spent, and they'll get the same benefit for investing in digital technology. 
Given global events, the government plans to campaign on national security. The budget confirms large quantities of cash are being pumped into the military. And tonight, an extra $9.9 billion is going towards improving the offensive and defensive cyber capabilities of the secretive Australian Signals Directorate. There's also pre-election cash tailored to different parts of the electorate, like $7.4 billion for regional dams and water projects, $2 billion for regional jobs, and more than $650 million to settle an extra 16,500 Afghan nationals. All this spending will see our debt peak at around $860 billion in a few years' time. Economists say it's manageable now, but could make the country more vulnerable to unexpected events. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And there's been quite a few of those lately. And as we've seen, budget predictions often swiftly disappear out the door. And we'll have special budget coverage tonight after the news. The man appointed to act in the top job in Queensland Health remains under internal investigation over a taxpayer-funded defamation lawsuit. The ABC can reveal Sean Drummond was still subject to the probe when the Health Minister announced him as Acting Director-General earlier this month. State political reporter Rachel Rieger has this exclusive report. The Health Minister on the defence. And he's certainly suitable to fulfil the role as Acting DG now. After revelations from the ABC that Sean Drummond was appointed as Queensland Health's Acting Director-General earlier this month, despite being under internal investigation by the Metro North Health Service. It relates to allegations while he was chief executive, he signed off on the use of taxpayer funds for four psychiatrists to launch defamation action against a former mental health patient in 2018. Uh, Can the Minister confirm rights. why Sean Drummond was appointed Acting Director General of Queensland Health when an internal investigation into suspected corrupt conduct was ongoing? It was seen based on the uh, circumstances of the complaint uh, that it was more than appropriate here to continue that role. And as such, I think it's more than appropriate he be uh, uh, fit to fulfil the role of Acting Chief Operating Officer, now Acting Director General. A report of the investigation is expected to be finalised by the end of May. If at some point in the future there is a finding uh, that is adverse against the individual, uh, then I will deal with those uh, findings at that time. But at this point, there is no um, uh, findings of such against him. The opposition believes that until these allegations have been appropriately investigated and then dismissed, it isn't proper for Mr Drummond to act as Director General. Mr Drummond says he's unable to comment on the allegations as the internal investigation is ongoing. Mr Drummond left the health department in July last year to become a partner with consulting firm Deloitte. In January, he took a leave of absence from the company to return to Queensland Health to take on the newly created role of Chief Operating Officer. He was then appointed Acting Director General earlier this month. In a statement, Mr Drummond denies any conflict of interest. Queensland Health has rigorous processes and strict policies in place to ensure our tender process is fair and equitable. Rachel Rieger, ABC News, Brisbane. The inquest into the murders of a Brisbane woman and her three children by her estranged husband is probing whether police could have done more to protect the family in the weeks before. Police body cam has been played to the coroner's court of his release from police custody after breaching a domestic violence order. So, um, Rowan, we're not going to take you to watch it. He could have been arrested. Instead, police let Rowan Baxter go. The 42-year-old had just breached his domestic violence order and assaulted his estranged wife. But he wasn't initially charged over the attack, so was served a future court date. We won't be objecting to bail or anything like that. Less than three weeks later, he killed Ms Clark and their three children. The officer involved in the decision not to process him through the watch house, Senior Constable Justin Kersey, told the coroner because Baxter had no criminal history. He believed any further restrictions placed on him would be excessive and unlikely to be granted. This was his first offence. We were not going to seek any additional bail conditions. Every person's got rights and civil liberties. The court heard Baxter did have a prior violent conviction in New Zealand, but the officers had no immediate access to these details. Even if they did, Senior Constable Kersey says he'd still have made the same call. 
The president of the police union was also called to give evidence on day seven of the inquest, which is looking at whether authorities did enough to protect Ms Clark. He told the coroner it's clear some domestic violence victims are being let down because junior frontline officers don't have the experience to deal with such complex matters. And domestic violence is brought up wherever I go in Queensland and they want more training to better enable them to be able to do their job. Another officer who was tasked to work temporarily in the vulnerable persons unit and had dealings with Ms Clark told the court she was given no specific training before being appointed, despite it being a specialist role. Mr Levers told the court that this unit is too ad hoc. He says the officers should be permanent staff and receive specialised training, but he warns for things to really improve when it comes to responding to domestic violence, a complete overhaul is needed. My colleagues are doing the best they possibly can. It is time for reform. It is time for change. The inquest will continue tomorrow. To Lisa Siganto, ABC News, Brisbane. Russia and Ukraine have begun a new round of face-to-face -face peace talks for the first time in weeks. The Ukrainian government says it hopes at the very least to reach an agreement on how to ease the growing humanitarian crisis. More than 100,000 civilians are trapped in the besieged southern port city of Mariupol alone. The mayor says 5,000 have been killed there in weeks of heavy Russian shelling. To the north, the Ukrainian army has made several key gains, liberating towns from Russian control. Barbara Miller reports from the western city of Lviv. Ukrainian tanks enter the northeastern town of Trostyanets. It's been cut off by Russian forces since the 1st of March. But now it's back in Ukrainian hands. What's left of it? For locals, it's been a gruelling few weeks. Our entire town was occupied by Russians. Their tanks were in this square. In the evenings, they came to our houses and our basements and stole our pickles, potatoes, lard and cucumbers. Everywhere here, the spoils of war. Soldiers with one of Russia's most elite tank battalions came here and never left. The liberation of Trostyanets is a significant breakthrough and opens up supply routes to the besieged town of Sumy, 50 kilometres to the north. Ukraine's military says it's also repelled Russian attempts to break the defence of Kyiv. Today we have good news. Our defenders are advancing in the Kyiv region, regaining control over Ukrainian territory. We have liberated Irpin. Good job. Elsewhere, the Russians are still advancing, forcing people from their homes. These people arriving in Mykolaiv after fleeing fighting in their villages, tired, scared and angry. We've been sitting in the basement for a month and have not been able to go out. Look at me, untidy and all dirty. Yesterday they were bombing and nearly killed us. How is it possible to live like that? In recent years, the Ukrainians have invested heavily in their communications networks and they say they're robust. But widespread cyber attacks or strikes on critical infrastructure are, of course, a very real threat. And when Elon Musk agreed to provide a potential backup system, they welcomed it with open arms. SpaceX Starlink terminals are now distributed across the country. Their potential use highlighted by an attack today on a major internet provider, the most powerful since war began. When you receive such a very new, brand new technology in Ukraine and you could use it, I think it just gives you, provides additional energy or whatever, because you feel that uh, the whole world fights with you. As a new round of peace talks begins in Turkey, both sides have played down the chance of a real breakthrough. And it's emerged that Russian oligarch Roman Abramovich and two Ukrainian negotiators are suspected to have been poisoned during a round of talks earlier this month. With no real chance of a ceasefire, the Ukrainian president is urging his nation to continue the fight. Barbara Miller, ABC News, Lviv.
Solomon Islands Prime Minister Manasa Sogavari has defended his country's pursuit of a controversial security agreement with China. The proposed pact has sparked fears Beijing could set up a permanent military presence in the Pacific Islands nation. Mr Sogavari says the deal is ready to be signed. The region's rising power now dominates the politics of one of Australia's closest neighbours. Solomon Islands Prime Minister says he's close to signing a deal with China. We are friends to all and enemies to none. There is no devious intention, no secret plan. Manasseh Sogavari is insisting his country doesn't want to get into any geopolitical power struggle. We are not pressured. We are not pressured in any way by our new friends. And there is no intention whatsoever, Mr. Speaker, to ask China to build a military base in Solomon Islands. Despite these assurances, fears remain about China's expansion in the region. We believe that the Pacific family, in its broad, is best placed to provide security assistance to the Solomon Islands, and we stand ready to assist further if that is needed. The Prime Minister Scott Morrison discussing his concerns about the pact with his New Zealand counterpart Jacinda Ardern this morning. We do need to have a whole Pacific voice on this. This is not just about uh, us, it's about our whole region. China says it's a matter for Solomon Islands. Countries should earnestly respect Solomon Islands' sovereignty and its independent decisions instead of deciding what others should and should not do self-importantly and condescendingly from a privileged position. Mr Sogovare sought to calm fears by pledging existing security arrangements will remain. Australia and New Zealand will also remain close in our hearts as part of choice when it comes to the need to call for assistance in critical times. The Solomon Islands leader defiant that regional security won't be undermined by any deal with one country. Evan Wasuka, ABC News. Hollywood star Will Smith has issued an apology to Chris Rock, saying he was out of line when he slapped the comedian at the Oscars ceremony. Will Smith strode onto stage during the live telecast and hit Rock in the face after the comedian made a joke about the actor's wife, Jada Pinkett Smith. In a statement posted to social media, Smith condemned all violence as poisonous and destructive and called his behaviour unacceptable and inexcusable. After the ceremony, Will Smith was seen dancing at an after-party after winning an Oscar for Best Actor in King Richard. The Oscars Film Academy has condemned Smith's on-stage assault and is conducting a formal review of the incident. Investors in Star Casino have launched a class action following revelations in an inquiry that the company turned a blind eye to possible money laundering. They're seeking compensation for misleading or deceptive behaviour from Star regarding its compliance with regulations. The inquiry has heard the casino allowed prohibited payments for gambling from Chinese debit cards, despite the risk of money laundering. In response, CEO Matt Berkier resigned. A no-confidence motion has been launched against the Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan over accusations he's mismanaged the nation's economy. An alliance of opposition MPs called the Pakistan Democratic Movement is behind the challenge. Imran Khan needs 172 votes to remain in power, but about a dozen MPs from his ruling party have revolted. Three days of debate will begin on Thursday before a vote is held. To Finance Now and the Warm-Up Act for tonight's budget was a very strong retail sales report for February. Here's Alan Kohler. Retail sales rose 1.8% in February, twice the increase expected, 9% more than last year and 19% more than February 2020, the month before the pandemic hit. In other words, retail is booming. And what's more, the latest survey suggests that spending is going to keep rising by another 10% over the next 12 months. So why do we need a budget that hands money out and offsets the cost of living? Well, because that was February and this is March, and now things feel tougher. This graph shows the current financial conditions sub-index of the ANZ Roy Morgan Weekly Consumer Confidence Index. And it's getting back towards the depths of the early days of COVID two years ago, largely because of higher petrol prices and rising inflation expectations. And after all, a budget is a political document about feelings, not an economic one. The dollar is back below 75 US cents today, despite those strong retail sales data, but that was mainly because the US dollar had a little surge last night. The local share market had its sixth rise in a row, and the story of today was falling mining and oil stocks, 
offset by rising financials and retailers. The US market had another rise as well, 0.7%, and most Asian markets went up, apart from Shanghai. And finally, crude oil prices fell sharply today as the latest outbreak of COVID-19 in China raised concerns about weaker demand for oil. Traffic congestion in Shanghai is down 45% because of the lockdown. And that's finance. Preparations for Shane Warne's memorial are in the final stages, with organisers touting tomorrow's event as a spectacular celebration of the late cricketing icon. The MCG will host Hollywood stars, cricket luminaries and musical heavyweights. Elton John, Chris Martin, Robbie Williams, Ed Sheeran. Some of the biggest names in entertainment will play in the name of a man who entertained the world. I mean, this is something, when you look at it from a concert point of view, that is almost unprecedented here in Australia. From a sportsman's night point of view, it's unprecedented. Some stars won't be there in person, but many cricketing icons, Hollywood stars and homegrown celebrities will travel to the MCG for the service. An extra 10,000 tickets have been made available. We've uh, had 50,000 people take up the seat allocation so far, and we'd like to invite people to come because this is going to be just one of the great events in the history of this city and this country. One thing he would, would definitely want me to tell everyone and, and for him to know is how much he loved them, um, how much he loved the public. The li lives that he touched, I think, all around the world, um, says volumes to the effect that he had on the, on the, commu the cricketing community. Warren meant a lot to many, even those too young to see him play. I just love cricket and just loved Warney and how he went about the game. Harrison McLeod says he wants to honour Warney's memory. He was just like a symbol of cricket, really. And he just like, meant a lot to Australia. And it's pretty sad when he died. Tomorrow, the tributes will move from outside the MCG to inside and on the hallowed turf where Warne was at home. Tom Maddox, ABC News, Melbourne. Australia's been dealt a blow for tomorrow's World Cup semi-final with all-rounder Elise Perry ruled out due to injury. Perry suffered back spasms in last week's game against South Africa and has been unable to prove her fitness. Captain Meg Lanning hopes Perry's tournament isn't over. We'll keep assessing her, you know, if, if we are to progress in the tournament. So um, unfortunate for her and, and the team, obviously a big blow, but we, we feel like we've got some good depth to be able to cover it. Australia is yet to lose a game. A specially bred koala has been released on the Gold Coast, which could turn around the fate of endangered colonies along Australia's east coast. Two-year-old Jake is the first koala bred from a pilot project called the Living Koala Genome Bank. It aims to breed koalas with healthy genetics to reduce inbreeding and disease. To not only breed koalas, but also ascertain their genetic diversity and where they've come from. Two more koalas are said to be released in the coming weeks. Now to your weather and your weather photos. Anyone from Toowoomba knows this well, the fog. Thanks, Sabine. Tony grabbed a clear shot of the setting sun over Gladstone and I'll let you decide who's in more trouble in this scene. I don't think it's the crayfish. If you'd like to send us your photos like Carolyn Bennett from Winton, here's the address. No rain in Winton, but plenty around the state. In the 24 hours to 9am, there were storms in this triangle between Cohen, Horn Island and Weeper, up to 70 millimetres recorded there. Then from Wide Bay down to the border through the southeast. The biggest falls were around the Gold Coast, 358 millimetres near Talabudra, over 300 at the Gold Coast Seaway and Miami, and 241 at Coolangatta. Those last three setting records for the month of March. The rain kept temperatures down, of course, six below average in southeast Queensland, around the same for the Darling Downs and out to St George. Basically, everywhere north of Meribara was above average, except for the Torres Strait. You can still see all the cloud responsible for rain on satellite, and even more so for New South Wales. That's due to this low, and these dotted lines are the trough lines triggering the showers, arcing all the way up to the Torres Strait. What it doesn't show on this map is a, uh, in the upper atmosphere an upper trough deepening this low and also making what the Bureau calls 
a popcorn effect of storms across the region. So no surprise what happens tomorrow. Showers almost certain for Sydney and Hobart. Also showers expected for Canberra and Melbourne. No FOMO for Perth. Showers over there in a top of 28. Back home, very similar conditions to today in the north. More storms, storms likely for the peninsula. Sunny as we hit Townsville, 35 also the top for Mount Isa and Proserpine. In the west, dry and sunny for most places. The slight chance of a shower as we move east to the Maranoa. And the closer we get to the low, of course, the more likely we get rain. Toowoomba has a medium chance of showers and just partly cloudy in the wide bay. Brisbane, an early shower or two, maybe up to 10 millimetres, 19 to 28 uh, degrees expected, 29 in Ipswich, 26 on the Gold Coast. Big surf down there as well, which is great for the surfing event starting tomorrow. On the bay, winds to 20 knots and looking ahead, the low is moving south, but will keep temperatures quite low. And that is news to the moment. Thanks for your company. Hello, I'm Lee Sales. Welcome to